Okay, I'm going to try this again. <laughs> um, I don't, if, if, if I have, if, if it sounds really bad, I'll, I'll, I'll get off and try again. But other than that, I'm going to basically just stick with whatever's happening now. So um, as I was mentioning before, um, there are many connections between Old Norse Sather and um, the magic from um, the past couple hundred years. Um, besides the troll or land spirits being important teaching spirits, there's also a similarity in that sometimes a little bit of blood or some kind of blood offering is necessary to like power the magic. So um, in some of the Icelandic magical staves, some of them were either drawn in blood or a small amount of blood from your finger was um, offered. At, and this was considered like sort of the transaction that allowed the magic to work. Sounds good now. Awesome. Yay. <laughs> um, now, obviously, blood offerings are mentioned frequently um, in the old stories, the old sagas. So blood as a powerful um, sort of conduit to create magic, the ancestors as a powerful conduit to create magic, and spirits of the land who, who may also sort of be connected with um, ancestors are also considered a, a powerful conduit to magic. Sounds good now. To, awesome. Thank you. Thanks for pointing that out to me. So other aspects are quite obvious, um, like basically um, the sacred number nine is consistently powerful um, and has been for over a thousand years since the early medieval. Um, there's a, a divination that's only maybe a couple hundred years old called the Urskang, which is basically um, a walk that you do around Yule um, as a divination for the, um, for the next year. And sometimes it, it involves going to a graveyard and the spirits that a person may encounter there look a, an awful lot like the god Odin. Um, and so, and also the practice sounds a little bit like the old Norse practice of Utiseta, which um, is basically um, called sitting out. So it's a type of almost like vision quest where you go out to a graveyard, a powerful place in nature, or like a burial mound if you are around such things. You go under the veil um, and basically you wait for the spirits to come and talk to you. The other thing that's really interesting is the word rune. Rune is like one of the most controversial ideas um, in terms of scholars like some people think that runes are just letters and other people think that they're magic spells. And I sort of think they're all of the above. Rune obviously is in Hovamal um, from the Eddas. So it's over a thousand years old. And it's also a couple of hundred years ago in Scotland in the Hebrides, which was a long time ago, the Norse kingdom of the Isles. Um, a magic spell there or a charm is called a ron, which is kind of like their version of the word rune. So um, you can see some of the connections that are, you know, that have like kind of stayed in the tradition, like even with all the changes and influences that have come from Christianity. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about Sather, Volva, and Spa, or the Spay Wife. This is sort of like the different kinds of magic and sort of what they're doing. But there are also a lot of similarities. So that's where it gets kind of complicated. The Nordic and Germanic um, seers or witches from a long time ago, and even now, were called vulvas. And this basically means wand carrying woman because they work with a tool called the stav or staff. Um, they would use a magical staff to, to access the other world. Modern practitioners very much um, agree that this is a lot like the way magical staffs are used in other cultures. like. In the Amazon, they use magical staffs. Um, the San Pedro tradition from northern Peru, they use like swords that are put around the altar. And basically the idea is that you're connecting heaven and earth and sort of connecting with the world tree. Um, Sather was and is the ceremony where the vulva would embody um, spirit helpers and speak to ritual participants about their future or consult the spirits on their behalf. These were and continue to be powerful ceremonies where weather magic, fertility magic, or other types of work might occur as well, along with the oracular divination. So other forms of divination, especially fortune telling, were called spa or spay in um, the Scotland. A woman who could do this divination was called a spa kona 
or a spay wife. Spay wife is more like a, a British version of that word. So say there's like transmediumship. Yes, very much like that. Yeah. There's a lot of classic Asian um, shamanism that's like a super charged up seance. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot like that. Um, spa, this kind of like foretelling the future was associated with the goddess Frigg who knew the destinies of all people. She even knew the destinies of the gods, but she would say nothing. And so throwing the bones, runic divination, um, con uh, consulting ancestors or nature spirits are like modern legacies of these old traditions. Annette Horst, who's a modern safe worker, who I mentioned a couple of times um, in this um, talk, she believes that Galdr runes, um, like kind of a wand magic called Gandr, that these are all sort of forms of spa or magic and that they're not Sather. Um, Sather is a little more like shamanism, but it's also a very powerful form of magic and the same people can do both. Spay wives in the Orkney Islands were healers, dream experts, creator of, creators of charms, midwives. Um, uh, they basically perform purse removal. They were thought to have the sight. So very like, like there was a lot thrown in there. They were also mediums. So even though um, the spay wives are not doing the classic Sather ritual, they're doing an, uh, some of the same components. So you can see where there's kind of an overlap. So the first kind of magic that I actually like spend some time doing in this tradition is not magic. So not magic was practiced in many places, including Scandinavia. One of the most fascinating uses was the story of untying knots for child labor, like for um, delivering a child. So what would happen is like if a woman's hair was like braided, there might be knotted cords um, put around her body. And like the, the midwife would basically cut or untie these knots and unbraid the woman's hair as she was beginning labor. Um, basically releasing the energy so that the baby would come out um, easily. And so as she's releasing the knots, the baby's being released from the woman's body. There's a really cool um, scene in a historical fiction book uh, by the, uh, and a writer named Octavia Rand Randolph, where she basically talks about, describes how a midwife is doing this in her birth. Um, amulets hung on three different cords were wrapped around a baby's wrist to protect it. Um, the colors red and blue were considered to be magical cords, um, cord colors. Then there's like a sort of a, a play where weaving also has a connection to it. Um, Gurmin Stocker, um, sorry about my old Norse there, um, witches shirts were like woven and they were considered to be a form of magical armor. Uh, so that, so weaving has a powerful magical connection because of its connection to the Norns, the, um, the three fates in um, Norse cosmology. And there's a lot of debate between um, practitioners and scholars about whether actual spinning was done as a form of actual sather, but everybody agrees that um, it was done as magic. So I'm very, the, 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 the thing I'm most familiar with with knot magic is wind knots. And I was first introduced to it by a woman named Renee Barabo, who runs um, a, a place called Wind Clan and who wrote a book called the. Um, Winds, uh, winds of change, I think, or something. I, I, I'll, I'll, winds of spirit. Yeah, that, sorry. Um, she teaches a lot of practices, but the one that I connected with was this wind knot project, practice. Now, it turns out that these wind knots were employed by Finns, Scandinavians, Scottish people in the Orkney Islands were famous for it, um, the Isle of Man, and even Devon, um, where um, people were like, basically like doing this. And they were basically doing this as um, a form of weather magic. So the Museum of um, Witchcraft in Boss Castle Cornwall has kept the practice alive and they actually sell wind knots and they sold some of these wind knots to um, these become sailors and the sailors were able to like, you know, unravel the knots and get where they were going. So these are like two different um, mentions of wind knots from two different times in history. One a couple hundred years ago, and one basically the story of Wollander, who is uh, like from the Viking era. So in the Isle of Man, witch, 
craft is exercised much for women there be want to sell wind to the shipmen coming to that country as included under three knots of thread so they will unloose the knots like as they will have wind to blow and then secondly a norse myth tells how volander kept the supply of wind knots in his smithy hanging there was a long rope with knots at regular intervals in every knot a storm wind was bound each week he untied a knot freeing the wind he sent it south with his mad song charged with thunder and hail and to this day the bitter winds that sweep across the gulf of finland are blamed on witches so like how do you even do this um whether you're using wind knots for weather magic or just because you know things in your life are you know kind of at a at a still point um you basically make three knots and i like to use homespun so you take a bandana a white rope or a piece of yarn go outside on a windy day and you make a very loose loop that the wind can blow through i'll show you this on the uh, the free gift but basically like here it is you just go like that and um once you get a a, a powerful um, like a gentle wind that would be your first loop and i would make that knot very close to the end of the string so you can tell a more powerful uh wind i would make the second knot that's in the middle the final knot is a really strong wind. And um, I'm gonna answer, the, uh, answer this question in a minute, but then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why you wanna use these knots and when you wanna use them. I was wondering if you thought that the San Pedro sword was similar to the Nordic stop. Makes me happy you agree with that connection. I didn't know about the connecting heaven and earth aspect. Thank you. Oh, cool. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Yeah, I to me, I, I see them as having, uh, um, similarities annette horst does um a, a, a powerful uh playlist about how she uses sather and she uses the stav and she sees it as being a representative of the world tree and that's what i think that those swords are doing too okay so um i have trouble writing sometimes so i've used wind knots to deal with my writer's block so what I'll do is I'll take the, the wind knot that's the closest to the end of the string. This is the gentle breeze and I'll untie it. And when I untie it, what will happen is I'll lay it on my um, altar and immediately things start moving for me. Now let's say I'm still stuck. Then I might go to the middle wind, the middle knot and untie that. That gives more of a push. The last knot is a very strong knot that usually I do during a storm or like when it's really, really strong winds. I usually save that for the end of a project or for the end of the year. The reason why is because that sort of like flips everything upside down so that you're like, you're, you're done with the old thing and ready for the new thing. And so I use that third knot much more sparingly than I use the other two. Now, when I'm done with these, I will, like, even if I use, like, the first knot and I don't use the second and third, I'll just go out look another time, wait for a gentle breeze, and tie that knot again. So I'm constantly, like, um, retying the knots and using them. The other thing I do is I lay the, um, the wind knots on my altar, and so that when I'm doing my offerings or lighting my candles, um, it's sort of charged and blessed by that, and I've found that that's really helpful. Um, so I reused the same hand spun yarn like several times. Um, I also dedicated one of my wind knot, um, loops to the goddess Frigg, um, because you're supposed to, um, dedicate, um, your best, um, weaving, knitting, or spinning to her for that year on, um, uh, mother night, which is one of the nights around Yule. So, um, these things can be used in different ways. If you, if you, obviously if you um, spin or knit, then, you know, you can do that instead. So the second kind of knot magic I'm going to talk about is the nine knot spell. Now, this is just a really common, like Wicca magical spell. Um, 
do you use the same piece of string? Okay, good. Yeah, I do. I, I keep reusing it. Yeah. And eventually I'll want to change it, but yeah, that's what I do. Um, but the reason why this nine knot spell is powerful for me is because it uses the power of nine. So I don't know where it comes from, but for me, it feels very connected to that, this kind of tradition. Um, it's been sacred, obviously, since the early medieval um, era, and it's a rhyming um, spot, uh, spell, so it's really easy. In fact, I've seen different versions of it. So like, for example, it'll say, by the knot of one, the spell has begun. So, and everything else like rhymes with the number, okay? But I've seen like different words used to rhyme. So what you do is the first knot you tie at one end. By the knot of one, the spells have begun. The second knot, by the knot of two, you do at the other end. By the knot of three is in the center. Then between the center and the first one, you tie the fourth knot and so on until you get to nine. This is a really powerful spell like that I like using when I need to strengthen my intent. And I like it so much that it's what I'm um, including in the free gift. Hey, Will, how you doing? Good to see you. Uh, so don't feel shy about making up your own words. When I was doing my research about this spell, I saw like three different versions of the same spell, but they need to rhyme. So I work with the knot until that thing manifests in my life. And then I like to release old spells out in nature somewhere, like usually away from other people. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad that you like that. And, and this nine knot spell, like if you look up nine knot spell, it's like all over the internet. It's really easy to find. So the last part of not um, making um, magic that I use is something called the knotless net making stitch. This is a little, like a little more closely related to actual weaving or knitting or um, even null binding, which is like one of the things that people do in Scandinavia. It's based on a really, really old, like from the Stone Ages technique. And the technique is you take a loop and you put another loop through it. And eventually you wind up with something that sort of looks like a chain. Let's see if you can see that. So it kind of looks like it's braided, but it isn't. And um, the stitch basically is repeated to make rows like, a, a, to make a single cord, or you can actually weave like a garment out of it. There's like um, bodies in the bogs in Scandinavia, which where they have like pants and things like that that are made with this um, stitch. Also, it's how you make fishing nets. So if you've ever seen one of those You may not see me for a minute. Have you ever seen one of those gourds that has like a weird fishing net around it? That's, they probably used knotless net making stitch to make that gourd. So what I do is I, I used this, um, I used this um, stitch to make a bag that connects with my, one of my ancestors. And while I was weaving the stitch, I thought about my ancestor and, um, you know, sang things and stuff like that. So that's a way you can like use a really simple, like practical stitch that you can actually make something out of. Okay, so let me just take a break and see if anybody um, has a question. Okay. The second thing I wanna talk about, the second kind of magic I wanna talk about that actually has a connection to both Sather and, you know, folk magic is something called Galdr. Galdr is basically a form of sacred singing and chanting. Um, words are almost like words are very magical in the Germanic traditions. Um, writing is magical. There's a lot of interplay. And in order to use something, there's this idea that everything um, has its song. And so it's a little bit like you know, Native American people who believe similar things. And this galdr has been around since the Viking era. In fact, there are witches whose specialty is galdr. Excuse me, galdr, and they're called galdr kona. Um, kona just means woman. So basically, you're singing or chanting to create a type of enchantment. So the first one is charms. 
Uh, like Scottish magic, there's an awful lot of charms or runes, which are like, is another way for a magic spell where if you want something to work, you have to like say the magic spell. So spoken charms are integrated into many magical workings in these spells. I use ones with rune in it for shamanic dream work and it really is helpful. Um, I like to sing mine and this particular charm rhymes so it's easy to remember. So there's also like, charms can also employ the power of healing stor stories. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I'm gonna give two examples from something that's really, really famous from the um, Anglo-Saxon era. Excuse me. It's a charm called the Nine Herbs Charm. And it's one of the charms that is still used today that we know is from the early medieval. But the first thing I want to talk about is how sometimes during the charm, the healer will tell a story about a powerful spiritual figure that makes um, a magical miracle happen. While they're doing this, they're sort of becoming that spiritual being able to create the same exact miracle. Do you think maybe the Scots got their charms from Scandinavia? Uh, I think in the Hebrides, yeah. Because there's a lot of evidence, like even DNA evidence. Some of those little tiny islands, like they're like mostly Norwegian. So here are two spells where the healer invokes the power of a healing story, a healing deity through a story. Jesus rode over a stony plain. His horse stumbled, its leg it did spring. Jesus dismounted to cure the pain and made the injury good again. In the name of the God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So you can see here, this is like a Christian magical one. But awful lot like this next one from the Nine Herbs Charm. A snake cape crawling, it bit a man. Then Woden put not took nine glory twigs, smote the serpent so it flew into nine parts. Their apple brought this pass against poison that she never more would enter her house. So once again, you see like you're becoming like Jesus, you're becoming like Woden. That's how you like activate the spell. It's a famous, the nine herbs charm is a famous spell to activate the healing powers of a salve that's made from nine herbs. And the, the salve is particularly good against like snake bite or different kinds of infections. Um, the healer or sufferer is relating to the deity in the story, Jesus or Woden, and drawing on its healing power. The nine herbs are very famous. They're still used, and they're used in many different ways. In the Anglo-Saxon poem, Lak Nunga, each herb has its own verse before the story about Woden. So this one is for chamomile, one of my faves. <laughs> Remember you, Mace, chamomile, what you revealed, what you accomplished at Allerford that never for flying venom did he yield life since for him a man prepared mace for food. Now, the way I use this is I like to use, um, I like to drink chilled down chamomile tea. I drink it a lot during the summer. Hey Sylvie, how you doing? Um, so what I'll do is I just do a little bit of kitchen magic. You know that kitchen magic thing where you like stir clockwise what you want and counterclockwise what you don't want? So basically I'll just go in and if I'm having, like, if I just feel like I need a little bit boost immune wise, I'll, I'll repeat parts of the poem or even just think about parts of the poem, like what you accomplished at Aller Ford, you know, remember Mace, you know, what you accomplished. And then um, basically um, stir like either clockwise what I want to bring in or counterclockwise when I, what I want to take out. That's just how I work with that. Um, it's simple and it's something I can do. And um, it helps me connect with the power of chamomile. And believe it or not, it actually activates the chamomile and makes it a little bit more powerful because you're working with this almost like a plant spirit at that point, instead of just like, I'm drinking this herb because it's healthy and it's good for my nervous system. So then I wanna talk about um, also about runic gobbler. The simplest form of runic magic is chanting the names of the runes. As the energy builds up, it can be directed in various ways. I've heard of runic chanting used to support a vruva during Sather. So what will happen is I'll talk a little bit about the Sather ritual in a few minutes, but basically instead of having a song, the participants um, or the support people, depending on how the ritual is structured, will chant runes associated with whatever that um, vruva wants to accomplish. It can be used during a bloat, which is like a, an offering 
ritual to um, invoke your intent for the bloat, or also even some runes are connected to certain deities. Um, it can be woven into other forms of magic, like candle magic. I use it in candle magic all the time uh, for runic candle sendings. So I like to chant the runes Lagus and Brido before I do shamanic dreaming. Um, Lagus is like watery. It's associated with like lakes and things like that, but it also connects to like the watery receptiveness of dreaming. And Rido is like journeying. So it, it, Rido can be used in a charm for your car, or you could use it if you want a shamanic journey because it's, it's the, they're both considered to be traveling. A really, really complicated, and I would say you have to kind of be a specialist to get into this, is form of Galdr is called Galdralag. This is an actual like epic poetry meter that like scalds used during the early medieval that people have revolved, revived rather. It's really complicated. It's not complicated like a haiku where like you have to um, have certain syllables, like a number of syllables. It's complicated because you have to make words sound like other words. Like you have to repeat like the sound P twice in the line or something like that. So you're, it, it, so it's like alliteration. So, and there's a formula for it. So um, it's very powerful. I have a protection Galdor log that I use a lot. It's a great spell, but it's probably the hardest way I've ever done a magic spell ever. So obviously I don't use it a lot. But if you're a poet, if you're a poetic person and um, you're good with words, then you might really like Galdor log. It's very, very powerful. Um, the last two forms of Galdr, one of them is basically has been revived by the Scandinavians. Um, there's a woman, uh, she sings with a band called Wardruna, and um, her name is Lindy Faye Hella. And she basically does, has revived this art of Galdr. It's really interesting because basically what you're doing is it's a form of relaxed screaming. And this woman has a huge voice, right? So the person relaxes their throat muscles so that their muscles are very open and they fill their chest with air and then they let out a throaty yell and it's sometimes used with runes or other power songs it's very powerful but each syllable is extended when you do this kind of magic um it's also really really loud The important thing is you have to really keep your throat, your like keep your jaw loose when you're doing it. There's also um, a, the last kind of galdr I'm going to talk about is the vardloker. This is directly related to the sather ritual. Have you ever heard in shamanism something called a power song? Um, these are like sacred songs or a medicine song. These are sacred songs that are like um, sung by the shaman to or the medicine person to attract their spirit helpers to them. The Vardhalukar is like the Old Norse version of this. So it's a, it's a power song that's sung by a vulva, sometimes by her helpers to call in the spirits. Um, a lot of times the vulva is um, basically supported by other people in some way. It's structured differently, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but it's not it's not an individual thing, oracular sather. Um, and it can replace shamanic drumming in a ritual. Um, I have a bard looker that I use to enter trance and journey to the other world. And I think it works just as well as a drum. Um, okay, so now finally, I'm gonna talk about um, Sather. And I'm gonna use Odin a couple of times as an example. <laughs> so you can see sort of the connection between um, some of these arts that I've been talking about because they all show up in Sather at some point, which is what's really interesting. Odin could change himself. His body then lay as if sleeping or dead, but he became a bird or a wild beast, a fish or a dragon, and journeyed in the blinking of an eye to far off lands on his own errands or those of other men. Also, with mere words, he was able to extinguish fires, to calm the seas, and turn the winds any way he pleased. This is from the Inglinga saga, and it's obviously very, very old. 
Um, so it's really hard to talk about Sather without talking about the Sami people. Um, the Sami people are like the indigenous neighbors of the Nordic people. And there's a lot of interaction between the two groups. Um, the Sami are famous for being reindeer herders. And at one point might have been completely nomadic, but are like basically semi-nomadic now. Um, they have a lot of Siberian cultural influences, and it looks like they also have genetic influences as well. So they have a real actual shamanistic, like shamanic tradition. And this had an impact on the Nordic traditions as well. Um, there are frequent mentions of shamans, Sami shamans, called Finn witches in the sagas. And their shamanizing is called Finvika. Um, Vicky is like a name for a male witch. And so it basically means Finn witching. So it means like to bewitch like a Sami in the style of a Sami. Nordic Sathe workers traveled to the Sami homeland of Sapmi to learn from these powerful shamans and individuals with Sami genetic heritage have been excavated from Viking era graves um, with artifacts associated with Sather. Um, so th there's obviously, there was a lot of exchange back and forth. So the first type of gift I'm gonna talk about, which I mentioned in the quote about Odin, is called Hamthlepa, which is shape jumpers. These are people who can merge with living animals in order to see. So in the world of, um, of shamanism, there's this idea that there's this world that we inhabit now, which is like the middle world um, in um, Norse, it's called Midgarther or Middle Earth in the Anglo-Saxon. And then there are other worlds up or, or below, which are traveled to for other reasons. But one of the reasons why you would do a journey in the middle world is to see what's going on. So Sami shamans became whales in order to fight other whale shamans or to seek information in this middle world. In Heimskringla, which is another one of the sagas, a shaman becomes a whale to spy on Iceland for his lord. And what he sees there is in his shamanic um, state, he actually can see the powerful land spirits that protect Iceland. But he's actually seeing through the eyes of a living whale. Um, this describes a mild form of shape shifting, one where the spirit of the shaman merges with a living animal and shares its consciousness. A way to practice merging with um, animal consciousness is to consciously journey with your, um, what is known as the filia, or the um, guardian animal spirit. Um, in some traditions, it's called the fetch. It's helpful to perform a bloat first um, to one of the earth spirits, so that basically you're asking for help, or to your guardian animal spirit. Afterwards, you can call on your guardian animal spirit and you can um, spirit dance him or her and merge that way. Uh, one of my Sather teachers suggested this way in her classes and books, and it's really, really effective. Another way to familiarize yourself with this process is to read energy with your hands. So if you're a clairsentient, this actually will help. You put your hands around like either plants or stones, uh, or if it's a wild animal, even like within five or six feet and just read their energy through your hands. As you gradually begin to connect, you're actually sort of merging a little bit. And so it gets you comfortable with the idea of merging. Once you can feel the energy of your spirit animal and you can pick up the energy of living beings through your hands, it may be time to merge with a living creature and see through this, its eyes. One of my friends actually had like this experience spontaneously where basically she was lying on her back in the woods. And the next thing she was looking down on her own body through the eyes of a Katie did that was next to a tree. Um, hold on for a minute. Sami merged with the whales to fight. Yeah, basically they, they merged with the whales and, and the Nordic shamans did some of this too to fight other shamans. Uh, the Nordic ones seem to have used this uh, approach to see like they wanted to see something that was going on and they needed to be um, like out in the water to do it. The heart chakra is sometimes the starting port for, for this kind of journey, because you can see like, first of all, you're going out on the astral plane. And secondly, the heart is where you 
like have feel the sameness between you and something else. And so you have to be able to embrace the oneness between you and another creature to be able to see through its eyes. Many practitioners ask for permission from the animal that they're going to be merging with. This merging can also happen in conscious shamanic dreaming. And to do this, you want to intend to merge with an animal um, or plant while you're in the sort of half asleep hypnagogic state. The next part is shamanic soul flight. One of the classic shamanic practices is soul flight and um, or journeying in the old descriptions. Sami shamans like would basically they're, they're shown depicted like lying face down on the ground with a with a drum on their backs. They're completely like not conscious. You know, they're go they're off. They're actually astral traveling. Odin has a magical for horse, the son of his foster brother, Loki, called Sleipnir. What is interesting about Sleipnir is that it has eight legs. And in some of the Asian traditions that are not like Scandinavian, those eight legs correspond to the eight worlds of the other world. So you need this horse to go to those worlds. And it seems like for Odin, at least, he needs that horse to go to those worlds as well. So sometimes practitioners will like ask Odin to borrow Sleipnir and then thank him at the end. So that is another way of working and journeying. Modern practitioners um, can also use um, uh, soul flight for like soul retrieval or divinations that require like leaving the middle world where like seeing through an animal's eyes isn't going to help you. So finally, I'm going to talk about the most classic form of Sather, which is oracular Sather. But you, Odin, they say, practice Sather on Samsi and you beat on the drum as Cirruses do. In the likeness of a wizard, you journeyed over mankind. And that I thought the hallmark of an unmanly man. Loki's verbal duel. For many practitioners, this is true Sather, is oracular Sather, which is like the seance that Christina was talking about earlier, and is some of the most powerful Scandinavian magic. Oracular Sather may take the form of journeying while singing what you see or hear. So you'd be like going, I'm journeying over the lower world, da 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 da, da. Like you're Like you're basically communicating through speech or through song to the people that are in front of you. Um, or it, you may, the, an, another really common um, form of Sather is to actually embody the spirits that you're working with. And you may embody multiple spirits in the same session. And these can include deities. Um, some Sather workers use a drum it's hard to know, um, and others just sing and use the stop. And it's hard to know which Loki is describing in his poem. Um, but in the movie, The Northman, which just came out recently, um, there's a say the worker who wears a dress and beats a drum while singing his power song or Vardlokar. And then all of a sudden he starts speaking in a different voice. He's speaking in the voice of like a deceased character who you saw die earlier. And so the spirit possesses him and speaks through him to the person who needs information. So this is similar to classic Eurasian and Asian shamanism where, um, and it, 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 this may actually be the practice that has the most Sami influence. The drum is especially telltale because that's the classic tool of Asian shamans. And the other kind of interesting sort of telltale is the woman's dress. In some of these cultures um, like Nepal and some of the other cultures, Men and women wear an archaic form of a woman's outfit or woman's dress as their armor for um, doing shamanic work. The spirits will often possess the shaman in these traditions in a helpful way, and they will speak, they'll heal, they'll, um, they'll even eat and drink while they're possessed. Because powerful energies go through a shaman or sage worker, Embodiment can require learning how to work with the spirits in a helpful way. This particular version probably involves a ward song, which is called the Vardlinger, and a type of song called the Vardlinger, which we've already talked about. The ward songs are sung by supporters and help create sacred space. Um, now, in some ways, this 
this could be the runes if you have like what some people call spa sisters who basically support the vulva by singing these ward songs which could be runes or could be an actual song or sometimes in some rituals like the one i heard about in denmark everyone sings the same song so the vard looker that the vulva uses to attract the spirits is what everyone including the people who want their questions answered sing and they do that to empower the ceremony if it's a small um uh, ceremony there might be one person but that's the vulva but if there's a larger ceremony with a lot of people with a lot of questions there might be multiple vulvas and in those ceremonies um there might be ward people who are also acting like making sure everything's okay with the crowd modern practitioners may use the vard loker to initiate shamanic embodiment or they may travel the world tree yggdrasil to the spirit helpers who will advise them so some of them will like they'll narrate the whole thing that they're doing other ones just sort of go to places other ones the spirits come to them song seems to be one of the most universal ritual tool in oracular sailors so it goes back to the galder again some say the workers use a drum others work with a power staff called the stab that i mentioned before even during the viking era oracular sailor was used sparingly um it's demanding and other magical practices like are better for daily use but it's truly amazing i mean i'm really grateful to have been able to ex just experience contact with it um and it's actually done best with a group or at least another participant who can be like a ward or ask your questions so now there are, i'm going to talk a little bit about sailor inspired practices annette hurst who i mentioned before um has made a wonderful free video series on youtube about sailor she describes a sailor inspired practice for solo work so it's a little bit like remember i talked to you about um going under the veil the uti seta ceremony this time you would take like your veil or your stab or your drum and you go out someplace in nature that's powerful and you just work with your bard loker and the land spirits and dialogue with them that way. So this way you don't need other people around you. You don't need, um, no one else is asking you questions and you don't need ward, um, other wards or spa sisters. Um, so uh, basically, there is also um, a revival of the annual um, Yule divination ceremony I mentioned earlier called the Urskang. Um, you might wear the veil for that and use your stav and just go out to a cemetery or go out for a walk or just go and stand in your backyard. But whatever you do to basically you're looking for omens for the coming year. Um, and obviously, I, I feel like this way of working with nature is very rooted in tradition. I, I love it. And I like to use the stab and the veil. Those are my, those are my two favorite tools. So a final practice I, I wanted to talk about is from the fairy, the fairy candle rite, which I've mentioned before. This is from fairy witchcraft. It has nothing to do with um, Sather. So Ivy Mulligan teaches this as a way to become more comfortable with being an, an oracle. And basically, you can do this also by yourself. If you don't channel too much energy from the spirits that are coming through you, you can actually record what comes through. If you have like really powerful spirits coming through and they like shut down all the all the um, recording equipment, you might want to have another person be like your audience. They can spot you and make sure everything is okay. So they act sort of like the ward, and at the same time they can write things down. Um, but the fairy candle rite is really easy to access if you just go to the fairy witchcraft site um you can um you can get a copy of it and you just substitute whatever deity you want to work with for the star goddess i've worked with the fairy candle rite several times and i'm amazed at how versatile it is it's it can be used as a springboard to embodiment um journeying oracular speech you can heal others you can do a lot of really amazing things this way. So let me just take a breath one more time and see if there's any more questions. Let's see where we're at time-wise. By the way, thank you all who are attending live. I know this is an awkward time and I really appreciate it. You've asked great questions. Uh, 
Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, some ways to continue with this if you're interested. Obviously, I really love this. I'm very passionate about it. And um, I've created a free gift for all the participants, both um, those who watch live and those who watch in the future. So your free gift is going to be basically a combination of two videos and a PDF of my talk. That's just because I have a lot of written stuff in the talk that's like magical charms and stuff like that. So in case you want to like um, practice some of those, it's in the PDF. The first video is of Not Magic with Galder. So I'll show you a little bit about what it's like to work with the Stav and um, a Galder and then with Not Magic. You don't need to do all that to do Not Magic. But I found it's very powerful to mix these different magics together in the Scandinavian traditions. Um, the second video is a beginning journey that can be done by Sadh workers to go to um, um, uh, uh, visit the Norns, who are like the goddesses of fate. If you are interested in any kind of divination, you're working with the Norns, whether you realize it or not. And so this just allows you to have a, a, like a visual experience of that. Obviously, um, if you decide to sign up um, for the uh, link, it will be delivered to your um, inbox and I will be very delighted to um, be able to sort of interact with you a little bit more. Um, the second thing I just want to share just a little tiny bit before I leave is, um, and some of you are already in um, our Patreon, but Kirsten and I have um, a Patreon called Shamanic Earth Medicine. Um, if you like any of what we're doing today, um, I have basically a nine month um, dreaming class program called Dreaming in the Nine Realms. And basically it sort of blends introducing people to shamanic um, dream work practices with getting comfortable with the nine worlds of the Nordic and Germanic tradition in order to do things there. So it's been really exciting that some of you um, who are watching are in the class. And um, I love teaching this stuff. It's really fun. And also in our Patreon, we have um, a lot of other things. Kirsten teaches Sacred Tobacco. I'm doing, um, for some of the other members, I'm doing a, a thing about plant cleansing with plant energies um, this month. So we're working with a lot of different aspects of animistic and shamanic uh, ritual. So if you're interested in doing this, it's very affordable and it's one of the links that are, um, I'm going to be adding after my talk. I'd love to have you um, uh, be included in the community. I think we have a really cool community with a lot of wonderful people and um, it's just beautiful. Yeah. And then finally, if you really um, would like to work um, in a more in-depth way, um, I also offer individual sessions, coaching sessions, where we can work on these things in a more um, powerful and in-depth way, including doing some healing and clearing work. So I just want to say thank you. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, the Dreaming the Nine Worlds class continues to be awesome. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to share um, my gifts and talents with you. I really love this tradition. I love that it merges beautifully with other traditions. I hope that there's something in this talk that you can put to use, even if it's just the, the not magic or the, the chamomile that will uh, make a difference in your life. Thank you and I'll see you later.